Good evening, everyone. Appreciate you joining us tonight. We are having a live discussion about the new documentary that uh, is in the works, and it's going to be absolutely epic. We've got a bunch of clips uh, from interviews from this documentary that we're going to be watching that I know you're going to enjoy. So make sure you stay with us in this program, too, because uh, we're going to be doing some giveaways. And also, I have something very special that I have hid from the public. I've, I've told people publicly about my uh, big TV appearance when I was a kid on the Bozo Show, but I actually have it available to watch tonight. And I can let you all watch this. Me dressed up as a witch on the Bozo Show. That's how embarrassing this is. But um, I want to get up to 100 live viewers before I do that. So don't leave the program and share this link. Get it out everywhere you can. We want to get people watching this. This is going to be a great conversation. And if you want to watch me humiliate myself and show uh, this embarrassing video, we got to get up to 100 live viewers. If we do that, <clears throat> we will go to uh, we'll go to that video. So just keep that in mind. So don't go anywhere. We're going to have some guests on tonight. We're going to give you a chance to call in uh, too if you would like to do that and be a part of this program. If you have any, if maybe you have some questions about the documentary, and we're just going to have a good time getting everybody hyped up for the new documentary. So brother Paul, what do you want to start out by telling everyone about this documentary? Well, I think a lot of people are just not sure of what we're even talking about. So I think the best way to start this conversation is just to kind of tell people about the new film. The film's title has not been chosen yet, but the film is about the Antichrist temple, the third coming temple that's coming. It's also going to be just hitting on a bunch of different topics. Um, it's going to go through the history of the temple and the temple mount and showing uh the fraud of the the temple mount location so the film is going to be pretty exciting and it's it's kind of like if you've seen marching design it's it's really like a continuation of that film and so we definitely are gonna show that the jews reject jesus christ as their messiah you know because of the, their rejection Obviously, the temple was destroyed and that that third temple is not something that a Christian should support. And so we're going to get into a lot of um, really exciting information. And so we have shot 19 interviews so far for that film. We shot those interviews in 2020 um, while the lockdown was happening. I traveled around, went to like 11 different states, got 19 awesome interviews uh, from rabbis and experts and uh, Christian pastors and just a variety of different people. And we're going to be actually playing clips from all of those 19 interviews if we have time tonight. So we're going to be playing a clip from each of those interviews. And so you're not going to want to miss those clips. It's the first time they've been, they're being seen here on this show. So I'm excited to show you guys. It's, it's going to, it's going to be, uh, a great film. I, I really do believe that it's going to be one of my most powerful films I've ever made. And so, uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. Yes. Yeah. And what's interesting too, now when a lot of pastors hear like a marching design part two, right then they kind of going to shut their brains off and not want to listen, but I'm telling you, I don't think they're going to disagree with most of what we show on here. And one thing that I have found that is very interesting because, you know, in the IFB world, um, they've just been regurgitating a lot of foolish stuff when it comes to eschatology, when it comes to Israel. And the thing is, you know, there's so much that we actually do agree with. I don't think they realize it. And if they would just stop and think for two seconds and just use some deduction and some uh, common sense, you know, they would realize that not only is what we're saying 100% right, but they agree with it. And the fact that they're going to agree with what we're going to show is just a reminder, too, that they are not consistent on a lot of their theology or even their behavior when it comes to all things Israel, all things Jewish. 
And, you know, um, in some of these clips we're going to show tonight, the, the one in particular, what this guy says, most independent fundamental Baptists, when, if they were to stop and think about what is being said, they would not agree with this guy at all. Yet at the same time, they kind of are doing the same thing this guy does, even though, and it's just, there's something about hearing it from a guy that's not independent fundamental Baptist. Sometimes it helps you see the error of your way, but, um, but yeah, look, tell them a little bit about why we're using two. We're using people from, uh, all different religions throughout Christianity, throughout Judaism, Islam. Uh, you know, why is that? Why is it important that we're doing that? The goal of this film is to get it from the horse's mouth. Like we want, if it's, if it's, if we're saying what the Jews believe, we want the Jews to tell us what they believe. If we say what the Muslims believe, we want the Muslims in this movie to say what they believe. And then, um, you know, we're going to tie it back together with scripture, of course. And then that's when we'll show the, the pastors, you know, telling, presenting the truth. But you know what? I think that is the most uh, powerful way to present information. And so we're doing the best we can on booking a ton of different rabbis and imams. So, so far we have two um, imams interviewed for the film and we have four rabbis interviewed for the film. We also have a uh, televangelist that we interviewed, a famous televangelist. We, we interviewed a bunch of different people because we want to get this to show kind of what all these different religions are believing in. So that's the idea behind that. And I think it's going to make for a very powerful, some very powerful scenes. And in fact, we are going to be traveling to Israel here in December. I'm going to be in Israel the whole month of December. And so while we're in Israel, we are going to be lining up tons of interviews with a bunch of different rabbis, um, a bunch of different imams, and uh, and so you know experts on the temple. And so I think it's just going to be really powerful to hear all these things um, put together in one cohesive movie. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, because the thing is, too, we're talking, we're spending, you know, most of the documentary is about the Temple Mount and the new temple that's going to be built. And, you know, there are going to be major political implications. You know, if that temple gets built, um, it's going to shake the world up in a lot of ways. And so that's why, uh, you know, we want to talk to Muslims. We want to talk to Jews about, you know, what that would mean, you know, what that would cause, because there's a lot of speculation on that. And we know it's going to happen, um, you know, and everybody agrees that uh, all of those things are leading to the Antichrist and what he's going to set up. But, you know, it is very interesting how much that the book of Revelation prophesies, how much is trying to be, you know, people are trying to fulfill those things right now, you know, but it's the thing is, it's a bad thing, you know, and it's kind of weird how Christians act like the rebuilding of this temple is a good thing that we should support. And that's crazy. And so um, you want to go ahead and play that one clip. Let's go ahead. I want to start out with one clip and then I'd like to have Pastor First uh, come on here and talk with us for a little bit. But do you have that one clip ready to go? Yeah. Another reason why it's so important, I think, to show uh, from the horse's mouth is because like in marching to Zion, you know, when you see the rabbis actually saying these sayings that Jesus was burnt, you know, was burning in hell that, you know, he was born of a, the bastard son. He's a bastard son and stuff like that. You know, when you hear from them, it really hits home. And so this is our first clip here from a pastor that, uh, you know, and, and this is what a lot of the pastors believe. One of the reasons that we support Israel so much are the promises that God gave to the nation of Israel. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 and Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish people, uh, God said, I'm going to bless those who bless Israel and I'm going to curse those who curse Israel. And I really believe there's a special blessing when you bless the Jewish people and when you bless the nation of Israel. I know churches that have dedicated 10% of their missions budget to Israel and they feel like in doing so that God is going to particularly bless them. And the churches I know that have done that 
are seeing an unusual blessing of God upon their ministries. And that is something we're moving to actually as a church because we believe it's so important to support the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. But God's promises throughout the Bible toward the Jewish people are quite extraordinary and toward those who will bless Israel and for those who will love Jerusalem. So uh, I think in a in kind of almost a selfish way, uh, recognizing that when we bless Israel, God is going to bless us. Wow. So yeah, so that's that's a real mentality right there. A lot of people feel the way that pastor does. So pastor first, as soon as he uh, is ready, he uh, have him. I'm going to have him join us and uh, be a part of this conversation. But uh, yeah, it, the thing, and this is the, the problem I have, is again, you know, if you just want to disagree about who the chosen people are, not a big deal. If you want to see Jews and just do something nice for them, you know, buy them a sandwich or something like that, you know what, fine, whatever. Um, but at the same time, we can't support them in everything they do. Some of these things they're doing are really bad. And and uh, rebuilding the temple is a, a really bad thing. And, you know, trying to offer up sacrifices again, that's a really, that's a really bad thing that uh, Christians should not support at all. And so to, to hear this, you know, these people, they're just taking this stuff too far. And it, uh, I'm surprised, I wish more, you know, regular IFB types would call that out because I think it is, it's just, it's very foolish, and I think it makes us look bad as Christians when we do that. Right. But, uh, guys, if you want to, you know, support this film, there are ways to do that. We're, we're trying to raise funds for this upcoming trip to Israel and to, to shoot all these interviews, and we're also uh, making available all of these interviews online so those are available now online every single one of them all 19 of them are available to watch the full uncut interviews so if you want to do that that's a great way to support us as well yeah and yeah uh there's a link in the description of this video too so you can donate to the project and if you'd like to <clears throat> donate to that i mean for sure um you know get involved in that so and the, the one thing I'm really excited about in this documentary, too, is there is going to be a very strong point to Jesus Christ in this. Um, uh, with, with what we are planning on doing, if things go the way we want to, I mean, I think we're going to probably see one of the best illustrations of, you know, the sacrifice that uh, of Christ and the representation of, of these things in the old testament what they meant and in a way like it's never been done before and so um i you know i think we could potentially see a lot of people get saved through this but i just uh looks like we got pastor first let me get that number off the screen but all right can you hear us pastor first i can yeah awesome so G were you able to see that clip yeah i saw i think i saw most of it Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what, what do you think about that? Was that, is that guy just an out to lunch dude that we found, or is that the mentality of a lot of people? Well, I think that's, I think that's the mentality of a lot of pastors and Christians. I don't know who that guy was, uh, but I'm seeing Israeli flags up in the front of a lot of Baptist churches now. And, and then just the idea that you don't, you just, whether they verbalize it or not, they do believe that, that, um, the promise to Abraham somehow correlates to everyone who claims to be a descendant of Abraham and that you just, you, you, you don't want to be cursed. You want to be blessed. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's just a general attitude, a general idea that, that people have. Um, it's almost like a talisman or a lucky rabbit's foot. Um, the idea of blessing Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, one of the men in our church, he's t told the story how when he was at Hiles Anderson, uh, Bill Grady was teaching there at the time, and there was a, a saved lady that was there at the school, but she was also of Jewish descent, and uh, Bill Grady was telling people the importance 
of being a blessing to her. And they were like talking about how, you know, you need to go find a Jew to be a blessing to and specifically point her out, you know, not because of her Christianity, but because <laughs> she was of Jewish descent too. As I wrote my book, I mean, America has blessed Israel probably more than any nation. And yet America in the last 70, 80 years has not received great blessings by blessing the modern day Christ rejecting Israel. It, it, it's not working. Um, we're giving $11 million to Israel every day, according to uh, what, if only Americans knew. Um, and it, we're not getting $11 million worth of blessings every day. <laughs> no, no, not, not even close. No. Yeah. And, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of these things though, that Baptists just aren't willing to they're not, you know, they're not willing to give it up. You know, they've said so much about it that, you know, just nothing's going to change their mind. And well, not only, not only are they not willing to give it up, but I think it's going to become a, a real stumbling block as we move forward, because I, I foresee our future getting darker. I foresee our country getting in worse shape. And, and so I think a lot of evangelicals are going to turn to Israel as the answer. And it's almost like we've got no other choice but to bless Israel because we've got nothing else left. Mm -hmm. And and so Israel already gets a blind pass for a lot of things. And let me just stop and say about this whole conversation, I'm not anti-Israel. It's just that the, is, the true Israel is Jesus Christ. And those that are in Christ, the same are the children of Abraham. And when America used to bless Jesus Christ, and when America was a blessing to Christianity, America was blessed. We were a blessed nation. But when we started blessing a physical group of people who call themselves Israel versus the true Christ, the true Israel, uh, we've seen a change in that. And America went from being number one to at the bottom of the list, being, being wealthy to being now broke. Uh, a nation that didn't have abortion to a nation who aborts millions. And um, and when I hear Christians talking about blessing Israel, I want to ask them about abortion because Israel's always had legalized abortions since 1948. Uh, abortion is legal in Israel. Um, many rabbis are for abortion and are very much opposed to the recent Supreme Court decision uh, against abortion. Um, I, I want to ask my evangelical brethren, why are we blessing and supporting people who are who are antichrist and who are pro-abortion and who are pro-homosexuality, who have a huge involvement in Hollywood and in our corrupt politics as well. It's not working. We got to stop this nonsense. This lucky rabbit foot, this, uh, this talisman is not working. It's wrong. And we need to get back to blessing Jesus Christ and uh, the true Israel of the Bible. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of the problem that we have is when it comes to going from the Old Testament to the New Testament, most people in the IFB world, they've used kind of the Clarence Larkin dispensational theology formula to figure out how to rightly divide and, and all those things. And that formula is just so bad and it has so many flaws. And it's illustrated by the fact that it's clear that while Christians understand the sacrifices are done, they don't fully understand the significance of that. They don't understand the significance of the renting of the veil in, tw in Twain. They don't understand the, the significance of the temple being destroyed, those things going away, the new covenant coming in. Uh, and, it's, and that's illustrated by the fact that people, literally Christian people, will support the idea of rebuilding another temple, not understanding that that is a major rebellion against god in probably the biggest way you can imagine absolutely and i want to remind my my especially my baptist brethren the bible heaven and earth will pass away but my words shall not pass away hebrews says neither by the blood of bulls and goats but by his own blood so how can hebrews still be the word of god and yet you have this temple getting built that supposedly god ordained if they do rebuild this temple that the Temple Institute wants to be rebuilt, if they do sacrifice red heifers and they sprinkle their ashes on this site and all this stuff, it is antichrist. 
if I told you that there was animal sacrifices going on in your town, you would immediately think that's a satanic thing. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow when we talk about the, the future temple, quote unquote, animal sacrifices have to be involved. And yet that's not satanic. Hold on. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, the veil ripped in two. And that was God saying no more animal sacrifices. It's done. It's over. It is finished. And for, for humankind, no matter who it is, Jew or Gentile alike, for humankind to go back to animal sacrifices is absolutely trampling the blood of Christ. It's absolutely a spit in the face of Jesus Christ, which is exactly what this is. It's anti-Christ. The very concept of a physical temple and animal sacrifices is anti-Christ. It's satanic because the temple of God is the church. We are the temple of God. We are the body of Christ. We are the temple of God. And ever, ever since Jesus died on the cross and the veil ripped in two, you can't show me one animal sacrifice in the word of God that was God ordained. It stopped. It was done. There was, there was the lamb whose blood uh, was, the blood was shed and the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. And this, this lamb, when he cried out, it is finished and the veil ripped in two, that was it. That was the end of animal sacrifices. And so how do you explain the book of Hebrews in this supposed seven year tribulation? How do you explain that? How do you explain the word of God still being authentic and legitimate if you've got, if you're going backwards in their supposed seven year tribulation, you can't, it's impossible. Yep. Yeah. You nailed it. And, and so th that's one of the things we're hoping to do with this film is one show people the purpose of the temple. Originally, we're going to go through the history of it, show the purpose of it. Cause it did have a place. It did have a purpose, but then we also want to, we got, and all Baptists agree with this. All those things of the temple pointed to Jesus Christ. And, but then they forget that when Jesus Christ died and he removed those things, that it is, it is an abomination to go back to that. And I think people understand that. But yet at the same time, when Christians see Jews making a move back towards that temple, even though God finished it, even though God removed it to keep them from going back to those things, for them to get excited that they're doing these things to me, it doesn't show a love for the Jewish people at all to, you know, so when they're getting excited about the red heifers, they should be brokenhearted that they still think that that's a thing, but no, they're getting excited about it because good for us. We must be about out of here. No, they should be. I mean, they should be boldly standing against that and calling out to these people and letting them know how wicked this is, but, but they're not like that one guy in the clip. Let's just support them, whatever they want to do. Let's support them. I think that's the most unloving. You know, you want to talk about anti-Semitism. I think I think that's it. They're assuming that, well, the Jews get a second chance. After the rapture, they're going to have seven more years to get it figured out. And so this is all God-ordained, and this is going to be a good thing. And uh, it's just proof that the time is close. Well, I'll say this. Uh, recent events are definitely indicating that time is drawing near. Uh, but I'm not excited about a physical temple or the ashes of red heifer read the last chapters of isaiah where god says where's a house that you can build for me you 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 sacrifice a lamb it's as if you cut off a dog's head or or or, or, or swine or something like that swine's blood uh god is not impressed with animal sacrifices today that, that is that is an abomination it's antichrist and when i say the word antichrist the word antichrist doesn't just mean against anti doesn't isn't just against it's it's a replacement it's instead of which is why this is antichrist because it's literally instead of they're substituting these animals for christ they're substituting this physical temple for the spiritual temple the the, the church and they're rubbing out christianity is what they're doing and and so christians should not be helping christians should not be excited about this this should be an, a, an alert alarming abomination to every alert bible believing christian amen yeah well hey i always Love getting your input on the subject. And if you have not read Pastor First's book, Who is Israel? Highly recommend that book. Uh, we've done discussions with him on that. And then also the KJV <clears throat> or King James Bible versus the pre-trib. I appreciate you coming on and uh, your input. Yeah, make sure you guys check out. If you want to leave a link in the to your um, your book 
on on the comments, that'd be good because I okay. definitely definitely recommend reading Pastor First's books on these. They're good stuff. So, thank you so much All for right. joining us. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. All right. So, so do you have some more clips <laughs> that you want to play? Here is the next clip. In 70 AD, the second temple was destroyed. Now, when Jesus was walking out there with his disciples, they said, oh, Lord, look at this big, marvelous building. This is beautiful. He said, guys, not one stone is going to be left upon another. That's a strange prophecy. Not one stone left. I mean, a lot of buildings get destroyed, but they don't take every brick apart. Well, according to the story I've heard, the inside of the temple, the ceiling, was covered in gold. And so when the Romans finally conquered them after fighting ferociously for a long time and losing a lot of soldiers, the Romans were angry that they didn't just surrender. So they slaughtered them by the thousands. And the temple caught fire. The gold in the ceiling melted and ran down between all the bricks. So the Roman general told his soldiers, take every brick apart, scrape the gold out. Every stone taken apart, just like Jesus said would happen. It was so thoroughly demolished they didn't, nobody knew where it was for 600 years. The Muslims came in there, conquered the land, and said, oh, we think it was here, so they built their mosque. Well, they're off by a couple hundred yards. That's not where it is, or where it was. All right. So, uh, a lot of good stuff right there. A lot of people do not know about the events of 70 AD, and these are important historical events. They, they really are. And they are, they were very clearly prophesied by Jesus Christ. He said it was going to happen in that generation. And that, and, and Christians, we take for granted what, how big of a deal that was, because that temple was everything to the Jewish people. And it not only was it everything to the Jews who rejected Christ, and we've been going through the book of Acts in our church, but even saved Jews, they still were very attached to that temple um, during the time of the book of Acts. And it was, uh, it was a real challenge for them. And I do, I believe God needed that temple to go away in, in order for uh, the, you know, save Jews to stop getting tempted to going back to those things. And God did, got rid of it, and he got rid of it for a reason. And it was judgment on Jerusalem. It was, it was a prophesied judgment on Jerusalem and, you know, when it comes to Daniel's 70th week, and I'm not trying to, you know, split hairs and stuff right here, but that was a prophecy about Jerusalem. The 70 weeks were about Jerusalem. I do believe that there, they were, what happened then was a shadow fulfillment of what's going to come globally on the whole world. But we can't ignore the primary application of that prophecy and that it was about Jerusalem. The things that happened uh, with the temple was the fulfillment of that. God was judging Jerusalem, and he did it. And um, it's important that people understand that, because and because people don't know about that, they're making everything in Bible prophecy about the tribulation coming in the future. But no, a lot of the specifics were about things that happened in that generation, and they were shadows of what was going to come in the future. And so we need to, we don't want to forget that. And a lot of people don't understand that. And so covering these details in this documentary, I think is going to be very helpful to people and it's going to help them understand their eschatology a lot better. And, you know, and what I just said too, it's another one of those things. I think most people agree with it. They're just not thinking it. They're not critically thinking. They're not thinking these things through. So good clip there. But, um, yeah, we do have several clips. And again, if you would like to call in, um, you know, feel free to call that number and we'll get you on here. We're going to play some more clips. We're also going to have Pastor Boyle join us here in a little bit. Um, he is going to be on this film and uh, we've got a, a clip with him that we're going to show in a little bit. In fact, <clears throat> um, why don't we go ahead and you want to go ahead and show the clip of Pastor Boyle? Yeah. Yeah, I could show that. Let me let me track that down real quick. Pastor Boyle, I saw you in the live chat. What we'll do, don't try getting on. It'll mess up our screen. Uh, but until after your clip is done, once he plays your clip, uh, you can join us. And uh, we will 
uh, you know, hear what he has to say about this. Pastor Boyle's preaching through the book of Revelation right now, too. So I'm sure his mind is filled with all this end time stuff right now. So he should be ready to go and talk about this. But you ready to play the clip? Yep. All right, here we go. The third temple will be the temple, not of God, but of the Antichrist. Because remember, when we read in scriptures about the temple, it's all about the Antichrist defiling it and declaring himself to be his God. And then that new Jerusalem that's going to come down that we read about in Revelation 21, verse 22, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So when we read about the new Jerusalem, the one that we're interested in, there's no temple. So this temple is the temple of the Antichrist. I don't think anyone would disagree with what he just said right there. I, I don't think they would disagree with that. But so here's the thing. Why would you support, you know, the Antichrist agenda? And yet they are so ready to do it and they feel so good about themselves while they do it, you know, because it's for the Jews. But it's like, no, they are in rebellion. This is not a good thing. We are not going to bring them closer to Christ. So uh, I'm going to have to send Pastor Boyle a text. I'm not sure if he's still watching this live. But if you are watching this live, uh, go ahead and join us. Uh, I had sent him the link. But um, hey, we are halfway to the viewers that we need to play the Bozo video. I just saw <laughs> we, got, we got the 50. So let me say this again. If we hit 100 live viewers tonight, I'm going to humiliate myself showing everyone me dressed up as a witch on national television on on the bozo show so we got over 50 viewers just keep sharing the link on this uh if people aren't interested in the documentary maybe they'll be interested in seeing me embarrass myself so um make sure you get the you know get the word out about this um do you want to show another clip while pastor boyle tries to get on Sure. Actually, might not. You know what? You might not want to do that because if he does, or yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Then I just won't admit him until uh, the clip's done. Yeah. So the next clip is uh, is kind of a follow up to that thought process of the the Wailing Wall, and uh, is that truly part of the temple? Here we go. I don't believe Jesus was wrong when he made that prophecy. In fact, I think Jesus was absolutely 100% accurate when he said every stone will be thrown down. And that's the mistake that he, I don't know how these these people go on their tours with their with their with their Christian tour guides and they point to that wall and say this is the wall of the temple when Jesus says every stone will be thrown down. You can't have that. You can't reconcile that. And so I believe that Jesus was 100% right in his prophecy and that every stone was thrown down. As Eusebius says in history, as Eliezer, as Josephus, they all say that it's complete and totally annihilated. So we've got to go with what the evidence shows and what history says. No, Jesus was 100% right. And those, those stones up there were not thrown down because they were the stones from the Roman fortress Antonio. Yeah, so right there's another thing people do not realize and do not understand that where the Dome of the Rock is, is not the Temple Mount location. If you go to the Wailing Wall, um, there there's all these stones that they say, you know, were a part of the temple, but the Bible says there wouldn't be one stone left upon another. So that doesn't make any sense. And if you read the historical accounts, if you read uh, the things that uh, guys like Josephus said, um, if you read uh, Tacitus, if you, you know, all these different uh, things you can read, they will talk about the fortress Antonia that housed, I forgot how many legions of soldiers. And so today they try to say this one really small section is the, uh, is the fortress. And it, there's that many troops never would fit in there. You know, if you read in the Bible, when the soldiers came to take the arrest the Apostle Paul, when he was preaching at the steps of the temple, it says that they came down to him. So a lot of people think, well, that's got to be the Temple Mount because that's the highest point. Well, 
in the Bible, the Roman soldiers, they actually came down to the temple to arrest Paul. So you know, these are important things. But, um, you know, and while he's working on that, too, just a few more things. And Robert Cornuke, uh, who was just on that last clip, he's got a whole book about this subject. This guy is a really good authority on these things. Um, there's a video you can watch on YouTube at him uh, at what is known as the Cave of Melchizedek, which is super interesting. Um, that it, That's another very interesting place we're hoping we can get to. Um, that there's some really interesting history behind, behind there. Because here's what we want to show, kind of a big picture of what we want to show in this thing. So first of all, Jerusalem, it was known as Jebus, or it was the land of the Jebusites before Israel got it. And that place was the place where um, Melchizedek was. And it's also the place where Abraham took Isaac to be sacrificed. And so all these things happened there. Je so I believe Melchizedek was Jesus. He was there in Jerusalem during the time of Abraham. We see that when God uh, brought them into the land of Israel, first they had a tabernacle, but God said, eventually, I'm going to choose a city where I'm going to place my name forever. And eventually God chose Jerusalem. We see then that um, after God chose Jerusalem, they, or they eventually built that temple. All those sacrifices were very important. It was also in Jerusalem where uh, Jesus made it, you know, took upon himself the role of high priest and offered up himself as the sacrifice. Everything about the temple was there to point to Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. And so we're wanting to show the reason Jerusalem is such an interesting city. It's not about because of the fact that Christian Jews and Muslims all have a connection there. What's so imp important about Jerusalem is Jesus Christ. It's what he did there. We want, you know, and there's a lot of documentaries out there that are about Jerusalem. I watched one years ago in Branson at an IMAX. It was all about Jerusalem and they made it all about the people, about the Christians, about the Jews and about the Muslims. And it was this big politically correct feel good thing. And it was, you know, a visually appealing documentary. It looked really neat. It was neat seeing all the old places. But at the end of the day, um, you know, there was no lifting up of Jesus Christ because he is what's important. And so we want to show that there. And we're really hoping too. Um, when I went to Israel back in 2000, I remember uh, when we went to the Temple Mount Institute, they were describing a lot of the sacrifices and offerings that they did back in that, uh, back in the Old Testament. And as a New Testament Christian, when you hear them talk about these things, you know, you just can't help but see Jesus Christ all over that. And so I think it's very powerful when we show that, um, all right, looks like we got Pastor Boyle. When you show that, uh, first off, Jesus Christ, um, you know, he was the fulfillment of those things. It really does, it illustrates the rebellion that the Jewish people are in and their denying of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, you know, we really want to show that. I'm tired of, you know, people trying to steal Christ's thunder. You know, it's just, it's not right, and uh, we shouldn't stand for it. So, all right, we've got Pastor Boyle with us. Uh, let's make sure we can hear him. Uh, so can you hear us? All right, I don't hear you. We're making way too big deal about other cultures, about different people groups, and the Old Testament, it's all about Jesus Christ. It's not about um, it's not about a people. Some people will read these things like, you know, the Old Testament, it's all about the Jews. No, it's all about Jesus Christ. And the story of the Jews is showing how God preserved a people that, that his seed was going to come from. And that's why the Jews were such an important people. God promised that it was going to be through that line that the seed was going to come that was going to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. And that seed came, and it was Jesus Christ. And so it's amazing how people miss the fact that 
uh, what was what was good, what was important, what was special was Jesus, and they're still thinking, no, it's the, it's all about the people, and uh, you know, you can't do that. That's bad theology. So, uh, brother Paul, did you have anything you wanted to add or say while Pastor Boyle is trying to get situated there? Yeah, so I, I'm I'm sorry, guys, about the call-ins. I guess we won't be doing call-ins tonight for some reason. He's right; it is going busy. So I did not believe him, but I guess he he was telling the truth. So I we sometimes struggle with technology. All right, we see you. Oh, oh there we go. There you go. All right, we got gotcha. you. It's all you now. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm hoping uh, that you can hear me loud and clear. I don't know anything about technology, and it shows every time I try to use it. But thank you for having me on. Well, thank you for joining us, and um, always enjoy your input on these things, too. So, yeah, now that was – how long ago did Brother Paul interview you? Because it seems like it was it was forever ago when we were doing the interviews. That, that was almost two years ago, was it? Was it pre-2020? I'm going to, I'm going to say it was, um, cause it was certainly before the COVID thing or maybe not. It had been right around that time, either 2019, 2020, okay. but it's been a while. Um, I could tell it's old because the video of me has the green chairs and we've, we've, uh, upgraded, we've changed. I know it's a bad word to use, but we've changed. We got brown chairs now. So we have the green chair, brown chair. Well, I actually know the date. It's January 2021. So January 2021 is when we did that interview. Wow. Oh, okay. I didn't realize yeah. we were doing them that. Yeah, you know what? Because now that I think about it, you know, COVID made everything a blur. But um, we, uh, yeah, because I remember we were in Kansas City uh, doing some of those during the lockdown. It was like a ghost town there. And that was really weird. And they were trying to make me mask up in some place where there were no people and so yeah well i'd like to i'd like to jump in and just echo what was already said i got to watch uh brother uh, pastor matt first and what people are often guilty of doing is, is they focus on the literal things instead of what is being taught and just like they focus on a literal temple and they're looking for this physical temple they do the same same thing when they're looking to the physical DNA of the Jews, when Jesus would say things like, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, and they're thinking cannibalism. They, they never fully understood what Jesus was saying, because what he said was spirit and in truth. And everyone's focused on the earthly uh, t uh, temple, or the third temple, just like the earthly city, Jerusalem, which God has said is spiritually Sodom or Egypt. And so while these, while these events don't matter in our, our uh, biblical view, because we're looking for that new Jerusalem that's coming down where there is no temple, it does play a role, though, I believe, in end time events, because we do read about the Antichrist standing in the temple and declaring himself to be God. Right. Even a lot of your Zionist types, they believe that, you know, that that's what they believe is going to happen too. But at the same time, it just shows, you know, when, when, you know, when you act like this is a good thing, you know, it's just, it shows how inconsistent you are in your theology and how your focus is so much on the Jew. You're missing the point that this is, a rebellion against Jesus Christ that they are sure. literally, you know, when they when So for example, if you go back to the prophecies um, during the time of their exile, after the temple was destroyed, there was all these prophecies about rebuilding the temple and about how the Messiah was going to come into that temple. Well, that happened on Palm Sunday, but Jesus was not pleased with what he found there. And so he ended up basically telling you know them uh you know that he, they he was done the kingdom was going to be taken from them and jesus ended up replacing that old system with the new covenant system where he replaced the levitical priesthood and he 
uh, replaced it with the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek with him as the high priest. He replaced those sacrifices with the sacrifices of himself. And so then he did it. He fulfilled all the things that the Jews could not get done with the temple made with hands. And then they still rejected him. Right. And so God finally had to uh, fulfill that prophecy and have their temple destroyed. And so now what Jews are actually doing, even though they got their temple destroyed, even though they were scattered all over the world, they have been actively trying to get that land back without God's blessing. And they have been trying to rebuild that temple. You know, and this is all in rebellion to Jesus Christ. He finished right. those things. He took them out of the way. He offered up himself. He gave them a new and a better covenant. And they are saying no to this. And they are going to accept another man as the Messiah. And not only are they going to do it, but the world is going to worship this beast. So the, the, the what's going to happen, you know, you know, it, um, it's kind of a repeat of what happened in the first century in Jerusalem. But what we're looking for, it's going to be happening on a global scale where it's not right. just going to be the Jews that are doing this and rejecting Christ. This is going to be the whole world after the gospel has gone to the whole world and them saying, no, we're going back to that old system and we're accepting somebody else as the Antichrist. And, you know, we believe things like the mark of the beast and all that are coming. And yeah, he's going to declare himself to be God. And so again, most people agree with us on this, but the question is, so why would you be supportive of this? Why would yeah. you encourage this? Well, I, I do have uh Brother Matt, uh, Pastor Ferris' book here right on my desk. It's a great read if you haven't gotten it yet. Who is Israel? Um, it answers a lot of those questions. But I'm looking forward to this film because Paul, Brother Paul Wittenberger brought out something that I think is going to be eye-opening. And that is you're going to be hearing these things from the rabbis and from the official leaders that we set up or Zionism sets up on a pedestal. And this is... This is, I'm, I heard you guys are going to Israel and I'm a little bit jealous. I've never wanted to go to Israel until now because everybody else who goes to Israel, they go to Israel and they swoon when they see a rabbi and they find out why they do these rituals and they have all these deep meanings. And what, what I see is what you've already highlighted. I see rebellion. Mm -hmm. God said not to do these things anymore. No more sacrifices. None of the, all those things are done away with. The priesthood has changed. You and I, we're the priesthood of the believers, and there's a there's an entire people that are rejecting the teachings of Jesus Christ, and they will accept the Antichrist. And so, I have zero desire to go and just sit at the feet of these uh, of these rulers and and have them teach me their ways. But I have every desire to go and see and watch as they, with their own mouth will tell you that they are rejecting Jesus Christ and they don't believe his, the virgin birth and that he's of the devil. And I mean, some of the things that this film is going to bring out will cause even the most dedicated Zionist to rethink it themselves and say, maybe something's not right with my view mm -hmm. because it is an act of rebellion. And uh, so as you begin to read in scriptures, you know, the promises that were made to Abraham very clearly are made to all those that are in faith. The, those that are of Christ are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And then the, the connections will be made. Oh, wait a minute. Those promises aren't to these people who are Christ rejecting ritual holding. Even Jesus in his earthly ministry said full well, you reject the commandments of God that you may keep the commandments of men. And that's exactly what's happening today. Yeah, and I know what you're saying, too, about people getting all excited about seeing Jewish rabbis and things. It is. It's it's so stomach-turning. And it's like, no, this is – I mean, they do. They'll see them walking in their long robes and making broad their phylacteries and doing their vain – rep. I mean, literally doing everything Jesus said not to do. And they just look at them with just great wonder and admiration. What could we do to go bless these people? Why don't you go <laughs> – why don't you go tell them the truth? Amen. And Amen. so, you know, you know and, and we wouldn't ahead. do that with any other religion. You no. know, we wouldn't go to the Catholic church and sit there and sit at the Catholic 
church and and look at the priest because everything that they do in the catholic church has a reason but they're all wrong Mm -hmm. and we would not look at a catholic church with the same admiration we would the jewish rabbi but they're both wrong and they're both wicked and god hates both yeah well and what's interesting too you know this might change the subject a little bit, but a lot of the stuff that the Catholic Church does, a lot of their practices, the fact that they have priests, um, you know, a lot of these things that they do is inspired by a form of replacement theology because um, they have replaced some things that with the wrong that Jesus didn't replace. You know, it's important that, you know, we let Jesus do the replacing. And there are some things that were removed that the Catholics have added in, or they've just replaced things that were done with stuff that don't need to be replaced. And, but, um, you know, they do, you know, their errors are a result of a really bad version of replacement theology. And I, I do think it's very important for Christians You know, and you can call it whatever you want. You don't have to call it replacement theology. But I do think it's a very important discussion that we understand what happened to all those things of the Old Testament. That is a Mm -hmm. fantastic study because of the fact that, one, it helps us understand a lot about salvation. And also, it, you know, it it all points to Jesus Christ. You know, it makes everything about Jesus. But somehow... People are reading these things and they just see that Old Testament system is something that was special for the Jews that's just on hold right now. And then mm-hmm. God's going to bring it back in the tribulation. And it's like, no, that is not what's going to happen. Amen. That's never coming back. That's which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And it's not coming back. Those things are not to be brought into remembrance anymore. And so the fact that people are trying to do this, this is not this positive fulfillment of theology. No, even if it is a fulfillment of theology, it's bad. And so supporting the Jews in this would be like me saying, well, you know, the Bible does say that there's going to come a falling away before Christ comes back. So I'm going to teach false doctrine to help that falling away. Um, No, we should still fight against false doctrine. And, right. and just because the Antichrist is going to, you know, set his image up in a temple does not mean I should support the rebuilding of that temple and donating to it. Yeah, you could take the same, the same philo- uh, philosophy or train of thought. I like how you connected those dots. You could do the same thing about the mark of the beast. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go ahead and issue a, a one world government. Let's go ahead and get the mark of the beast out so we can get this process rolling faster. We're, right. to, we're to be salt and light. We're to be preaching truth and standing for that all the way to the very end. So there, it, it, there is irony. I, I do I do like what was mentioned earlier about this. I think it was the first clip where that the pastor there is just has this thought that there's this uh, blessing, this unspoken blessing that will just be upon you and your family and your church if you just bless the nation of Israel. I would be curious to hear those same preachers after watching the the film when it's completed, looking at, you know, when you don't have a face to the person you're blessing, it's easy to think of just Jews. But then when you see them spitting at the the name of Jesus and they hate Jesus Christ, they're rejecting him. They're not waiting for him to come. They reject him entirely. They're, They're looking for the Antichrist to come. They'll accept him. But because Jesus said, I speak truth, therefore you receive me not. And, you know, these people, they're just saying, bless them, bless them, and God will bless you. Probably one of the biggest reasons um, I, as a pastor, been in the ministry for over 18 years now, I've lost a lot of friends and the good friends. And their fear was, I didn't hold the right view of Israel. So therefore, by being my friend, God might not bless them. And with that fear in mind, they terminated our friendship because they don't want to lose this proverbial blessing of God by associating with someone in their mind who doesn't bless Israel. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's interesting, too, how they will, 
Like they don't get freaked out when Jews are cursing Christ, right. but they get super freaked out if we say something negative about Jews. I mean, I had that guy on the, I did a live stream the other day who was saying I was anti-Semitic. And then he starts talking about, you know, um, that conservative Jewish guy, um, Shapiro. Is that his name? What's, uh, yeah, whatever his name is. But I'm like, yeah, I don't like that guy. And he's just like, you know, I was like, have you heard what he says about Jesus? Uh, who cares? It's like, um, yeah, I don't really like people blaspheming Christ. You know, I, I take offense to that. Well, because we don't set them on a pedestal and worship them or idolize them, then we are therefore anti-Semitic. And I don't understand that. You know, I, you know, the God that you see through the Bible, he's no respecter of persons. He's rich in mercy unto all that call upon him. And it's not that we are teaching the Jews cannot be saved. We're teaching the Jews must be saved. Mm -hmm. and there's a big difference and so we're not cursing it if i were to say the you know the catholics are are not going to heaven unless they get saved that doesn't mean i hate catholics it means i hate catholicism mm -hmm. i hate the false teaching uh but because you're a catholic doesn't mean that god's going to one day just automatically open your eyes because you were a faithful catholic all these years and you're just going to one day on uh, on a, not according to your ability, but by the power of God, he's just going to force himself on you. And you're going to say, wow, I believe, but that's what they believe about the Jews that one day they're just all going to open their eyes and they're going to get saved, not by their own will. To me, that's just a, a far branch of Calvinism. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's amazing though, what you can get away with saying, as long as you say it's for the Jews, you know, right. and I, I, yeah, I don't get it, but but either way, um, but yeah, well, I'm said I'm excited about the film. I appreciate you coming on here and uh, you know giving your input on this, and it's going to be definitely going to be a great film. And yeah. appreciate your stand on the subject, and I've uh, you enjoying preaching through Revelation. Oh yes, yes, I'm enjoying. We we just finished chapter seven. You can watch it on our live stream, Revival Baptist Orlando on you on youtube but um man i tell you it's it's neat to see how relevant these things are becoming as as we go through the book of revelation again yep yep that's it's true so well all right well i'll let you go i appreciate right, can you I, can i uh, close George? out with a chat uh, just to encourage you to all the listeners support the film um i mean i've enjoyed the covid land series it, it's one of those films i can pass out to anybody and everybody my neighbors and I've gotten good responses from people who maybe don't see our view. Uh, it, it's put in a way where if you really want to know truth, it's written for you to take it and, and be persuaded. It's not, it's not belittling you, but it's just informative. And this film will take the same direction. And hopefully our prayer is that people who don't fully understand it, will their eyes will be open and they'll realize, look, we don't want to support this temple you know, we're looking for that heavenly city. So support Brother Paul and his film. I know uh, it'll go to a good use. Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And yes, please, uh, the link is in the description. Make sure you uh, get on there and uh, be a blessing to Brother Paul. And so we, we really do appreciate all the work that he does on these things. And it's definitely a definitely a worthy cause and so again keep sharing this we had got up over 60 live viewers and again those just joining us uh you want to see me on the bozo show early i'm not showing it if it doesn't get over 100 live viewers because it's it's pretty embarrassing so i'm gonna make y'all earn it but um do you want to start doing some of the giveaways brother paul yeah i mean we can do i think it'd be fitting to give away some marching in zion so i'm not sure how you want to do it so, um, yeah, do you have any uh, marching design questions? Does anyone? Yeah. Okay. So what is the name of the rabbi that started almost like spitting at Pastor Anderson? What is the name of that rabbi? Write it in the comments. I think that was such a powerful scene, too, just because, again, you know, mm. Christians, they forget just how much these people hate Jesus. 
And it's just, it's crazy that people are okay with that and don't get, uh, they're, you know, they're not offended by that. Well, and I think that's one of the main reasons why we want to show it from their mouth. Cause we can say all day, this is what the Jews believe. And then people are like, yeah, that's probably what they believe, but it doesn't really hit home. Like when you actually physically see these rabbis saying these things, it, it really does hit home. That is the right first word. It is Leo, but what is his last name? So if you get the full name, you gotta get the full name. I think I I think I know what that is. Isn't it similar to a famous Bible character? No. Rabbi Finkel Finkelstein. <laughs> no, no, that's not it. No. Um Well, we do have a clip of you, Pastor. Um as okay. the next clip so we could always play that and let the chat continue okay and you know i'm gonna i'm gonna ask a question too oh there it um, is jay ben oh, got that, it dustin helm oh jay ben, jay ben. Abrami. yeah abrami okay so all right so if you how guys he, what how you get this dvd you have to email me at framing the uh film nut 99 at yahoo.com that's film nut 99 at yahoo.com and give me your address. Tell me what. Tell me what you won, and we'll send it to you. J Ben is the one that won. Okay. I'm gonna before you do the clip. I'm gonna ask a trivia question that um, I want people to uh, <clears throat> look up. Uh, you, you're gonna you're gonna probably have to Google this one, but um, in the Bible, uh, it was prophesied that Zion, Mount Zion, which is where the temple was, would be plowed like a field. And um, there, uh, there was a famous individual who, in 132 A.D., attempted to rebuild um, the temple in 132 A.D. And as a result of him trying to do that, the Romans came through and they literally, uh, they after they defeated him, killed about half a million Jews. They tried to, um, they tried to rebuild, or they uh, they plowed Mount Zion like a field. They literally plowed it up, trying to remove uh, any evidence that was ever there. And uh, just like the Bible prophesied, that was in 132 A.D. It was a famous revolt. I want the name of the guy in that revolt. So you look up revolt, 132 A.D. Jerusalem. So I'm telling you all the key words. So look it up. And I want people to look up that story because it's a very interesting story. And I, I do think it was a fulfillment of prophecy what took place there. But let's go ahead and switch it to you and let's watch that clip. All right, here we go. The story where the Roman soldiers, 470 of them, took Paul from Jerusalem to Caesarea is important because what the proponents of the Temple Mount being where the Dome of the Rock is today, they all claim that a real small area there uh, is for Antonia. And the area that they claim is for Antonia would have only held about 600 troops. Now, Josephus and the other historians show that there were legions of troops that were stationed in that area. But let's just say they're right, that it was 600. Why would almost all of their soldiers leave Jerusalem to take one man to Caesarea? It really doesn't make any practical sense at all that that would happen. But it does make sense if History is true, and there were thousands of troops in that area. And history's claim on the legions of troops that were there, I mean, it fits with what it appears to be, you know, the fact that that entire Temple Mount area was for Antonia. That would actually work logistically. All right, so a great bit of wisdom there from myself. Uh, I, and I uh, briefly mentioned that before, and uh, yeah, so just a very important, you know, it's, it's a little detail, but again, we believe every word of the Bible. And so we believe when the soldiers came down to the temple, that tells us that the soldiers were housed in a place that was higher than the temple. Well, it just so happens Mount Zion, the modern day location of Mount Zion sits lower than the modern day temple Mount that is actually the walls are shaped just like an ancient Roman fortress. So, uh, very interesting thing that people just ignore. But 
Uh, Mike made you were the first one that got it, so make sure you contact Brother Paul for a Marching to Zion DVD. Bar Kokba, Simon Bar Kokba. I never can remember the name. There, the Jews today still talk about him. They have a derogatory name that they use that means false messiah because people literally thought that he was the messiah when he tried rebuilding that temple. And so um, there were several attempts in those early days to rebuild the temple that just completely failed. So um, so anyway, uh, so uh, you have any more? Uh, trivia questions or anything else you want to give. We're up to 65 viewers. I think that's the most I've seen so far. Y'all just st stick with us. Get the word out. Start sharing it. If you want to cheat and open up multiple devices, you can do that to uh, get us to 100. And we will watch me on the Bozo Show. I really I really have a clip. And uh, it's, it's pretty funny. Um, we'll watch some more clips here in a little bit. But I want to, I want to go back. I we were briefly talking about Robert Cornuke um, because he's got a lot of interesting stuff. But um, have you seen the video on YouTube where he's in, uh, I believe they call it the Cave of Melchizedek. That's where they have those carvings in the rock. Um, that is super interesting because um, they believe that that spot right there is probably – um, where either they did the sacrifices for Solomon's temple um, or even where Melchizedek did sacrifices is possible. And, and, and a lot of people get confused too because it's like, well, wait a minute, how could the part of Solomon's temple be there? Because I thought there wasn't going to be one stone left upon another, but that was for Herod's temple. And back in those days, they would always build over the city. Whenever things would get rebuilt, they would rebuild over what was already there. And so you had Solomon's temple that got destroyed, and then later they built the temple over that that was there in Jesus' day. And so when Jesus said there wouldn't be one stone left upon another, that was in reference to what at that time historians refer to as Herod's temple. And um, and so that very well could be something left you know, that was a part of the original landscape as it was in Solomon's day, but anything that would have been there in Jesus's day would have been something that had been built up. So, um, but yeah, so yeah, so that's right. kind of an important little detail well, there, but I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Scott Dunn for supporting the, the film. Thank you for your donation. 50 bucks, man. I appreciate it, Scott. Yeah, I'm on. Yep. Uh, yeah, every little bit you can help. You definitely want to be a part of this. Uh, it's definitely, definitely a worthy cause. All right, so this right here is a brigadier general that we interviewed who has uh, did a great job. Here we go. Is something that's not talked a lot about as you look at the Temple Mount area and as people study the uh, uh, the Dome of the Rock and the location of the uh, of the second temple and in that sort of thing and but we have to remember that that back in the days when the second temple was built that the land of Israel then was occupied by the Romans later by the Babylonians, and the, the whole area was, was under strife for, for a very long time. And one of the tenets of the, the military that we're always taught is to control the high ground. And so as you, as you look at the geography of that area, it becomes apparent that the, the high ground in that area in and around the, the Jebusite city was Mount Moriah. And so if I wanted to control the Jebusites or later on the, the Israelis that were, uh, that were descended from, from David, I would want to, to build my military headquarters and, and station my troops 
as close as I could get it to Mount Moriah. And that way, my armies could run downhill to fight and skirmish with, with the people that were uh, causing trouble. And it's, it's tiring, as we all know, to, uh, to run uphill, particularly when you're running uphill wearing armor and, uh, and carrying your weapons and that sort of thing. So from, from just a, a pure military perspective, I would want to, uh, to put my, my camp, my, my bivouac area, on the highest ground I could, which back then was, uh, was Mount Moriah. Another uh, just interesting thing, just showing common sense about how, uh, yeah, from a military standpoint. And uh, one thing that's interesting, too, when you look at, you know, the Temple Mount today and you see the walls around it, there's other Roman fortresses that were built around that same time that looked just like that. I mean, there was a specific pattern that they had. And so, you know, it makes it kind of funny all these people that are going and sticking their prayers in a wall that was a Roman fortress that wasn't even ever a part of the temple. And so, you know, I hope these people feel stupid doing that. But but uh, ho hopefully, too, we're going to get to talk to some uh, Jews, too, because this is one thing that I'm excited about when we go over there. A there's a lot of questions that I have that I don't know how they're going to answer, you know? So for example, uh, I'm really, you know, I've, I've been told they get very offended if you suggest that the Temple Mount location is not the real location, but I I've got to ask, I mean, the Bible is very clear that it was built where the Gihon Springs are. If you go outside the Temple Mount area today, uh, there's a sign that says Gihon Springs. They got Hezekiah's Tunnel. It's a very popular tourist attraction. There's signs all over that say Mount Zion. So why aren't why aren't at least Christians saying why aren't we calling this the Temple Mount? It's one thing that the Jews, you know, want to say that Dome of the Rock areas, but why would Christians go along with that? So I don't know, but. Uh, you know, 365 trucks, I don't know if you were here at the beginning, but again, we're getting the perspective of a lot of different people on this program just because of the fact that we're showing, uh, we're, we're going to illustrate too how the whole world is very interested in Jerusalem and the things about the temple. Um, not because, isn't it great that we all agree? No, it's actually kind of bad uh, that everybody agrees on this. And we're going to be, uh, and one thing I'm interested in too is asking these people what would happen politically? What do you think would happen politically if they were to start rebuilding the temple? You know, I think that's a very important question because we know the Muslims are going to throw a fit. But then also, um, you know, the Jews, we know most of them don't even really want the temple built right now. So it's going to be interesting hearing what these people have to say. I'm interested because it is going to affect things politically in the world. So now in your interviews you did, Brother Paul, did you get a chance to talk to uh, many Jews about stuff like that about the or Muslims about the political implications? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you can see all of those things if you go to FramingTheWorld.tv. You can watch all these full interviews there. Right now, we have all 19 interviews uploaded, so you can view them all in HD on FramingTheWorld.tv. So, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, I need to I need to start watching all those because I'm very uh, interested. I don't believe Leo Abrami is going to be in the film, isn't no. he in hell right now? Yeah, he died. Yeah, so uh, no, he will he will not be in the film. Uh, but um, I forgot where I was going to go. Uh, what I was going to say before that came up. I did. You know, it's funny is I did email one of the other rabbis we interviewed for that film. I was like, Hey, you want to do another interview? He, he's the guy that really uh, publicly attacked us for it. And, and he was like, no, 
<laughs> well, it's amazing how, you know, I don't mind getting interviewed by people that disagree with me. Right. You know, right. I'm, so, I'm so convinced that what I say is truth that I think anytime these people platform me, uh, you know, it's just more people that are going to hear the truth. So uh, I think it's funny. They're just so used to everybody, you know, kissing their big toe and their ring and all that kind of stuff. They don't know what to do. But but, you know, it is it's it, uh, it's interesting because we all talk about we all speculate what would happen if they start building the temple. And I'm hoping to um, to, you know, when we do these interviews, um, it's very interesting because I, you know, there's a lot of questions that aren't being asked. Um, and I want to ask these questions when I go there, but. Uh, a lot of people don't realize most Jews do not want the temple to be rebuilt. And I believe it's because of the fact that um, the, most of them, you know, um, most of them know it would cause a major ruckus in the world. And they don't really like rocking the boat. Uh, but at the same time, too, um, what they what their position is, is that they're not supposed to rebuild it until the Messiah comes. Which to me tells me, I really think if they start rebuilding the temple, that it doesn't prove it for sure. But you know what? I'm really going to think we're about to wrap things up, you know, if they start rebuilding that temple. And I do believe whoever it is that gets the ball rolling on that will probably more than likely be the Antichrist. Because when you uh, listen to the Jews talk about the temples too, they always talk about Solomon's temple. Because Solomon was the one who headed up the building of that. Also, um, you have Zerubbabel's temple. He was the one that headed up the rebuilding of the temple after the Babylonian captivity. So they often refer to it as Zerubbabel's temple. But then, uh, several years before Jesus uh, you know, came on the scene, Herod refurbished the temple. Because Zerubbabel's temple was very inferior to the original temple. And there's a lot of clear evidence for that in the Bible. You have the young men shouting and the old men weeping um, when the foundation was laid. And some people try to say, well, that doesn't prove anything. But you do have one of the prophets, I forgot which one it is, when he was speaking, he talked about the new temple and how is it in comparison to the old temple is nothing. He flat out said that, and I'm not quoting that exactly right. But when Herod came on the scene, he was a wicked guy, but, you know, he wanted to pander to the Jews to help himself out politically and everything. And uh, and he restored the temple to its former glory. And so they will often refer to that temple as Herod's temple. So all the different temples kind of have a name on it. And you know what? They're just naturally going to want to name this next temple after somebody. And I think it, I think whoever they name it after is probably more than likely going to be the Antichrist. So just kind of an inter interesting thing there. But do you have any more clips you want to play? Do you have any clips from Muslims or Jews? Yeah, I mean, uh, I could skip ahead to one. Okay, one. well, whatever you want to do, whatever war you had, let's go ahead and watch some more clips. I think these are, these are good. Here we go. Josephus is one of the really interesting historical personages in the ancient world. He is one of the world's great writers of history and was actually involved in some of the active rebellion against Rome uh, in 66 or so. I think he was born in 37 before the common, of the common era, 37 of the common CE or so. And maybe he was reading the political winds, but he sort of switches uh, sides and forms a a connection with Titus has uh, offers up something that he claims is a prophecy and gains uh, himself entree into high Roman culture and society and proceeds to write some very important and rather lengthy books on history including the first Jewish Roman war which I read 30 years ago and, and can barely recall uh, most of the details for 
But he also is one of the only um, historians that we have for that time. And so we have this struggle to sort of know how much of what he writes we can believe, right? Because we don't have corroborating evidence. Um, but he is a, a very important source for daily life, custom, ritual, um, and what, what society looked at, looked like at that time. Josephus will probably be referenced a lot. And I just want, I'd like to take this moment to just kind of drop a truth bomb <laughs> on everybody. So um, a lot of Baptists, you know, again, they, they've, they're not familiar with Josephus. And a lot of times you'll hear people get real pompous and talk about how Josephus isn't Bible. And let me just say, nobody claims Josephus <laughs> and his writings are equal with Scripture. Nobody says that. Okay. But at the same time, it is history. And, you know, there's a lot of historical events that preachers will get up and refer to. But here, here's the problem a lot of people have with Josephus. And, and this is a truth everyone needs to get a hold of. Okay, While history is not equal to Bible, just understand your theory about how a prophecy might play out is not superior to history. And a lot of people, the reason they get bent out about, bent out of shape about hearing Josephus referred to is because of the fact that um, a lot of people have just absolutely butchered prophecies about Daniel's 70th week. They've actually butchered prophecies from the Olivet Discourse. And so they will hear people get up and they'll cite Josephus and then talk about stuff that he referred to that lines up exactly with what we see in Matthew 24, and then they act like we are adding to the scriptures. And it's just like, no, we're just showing how history proves Christ's prophecy exactly correct. What you're trying to do, though, you've come up with a bad interpretation of a Bible prophecy, and you're, and you're just mad that that person who cited Josephus is making a lot more sense than you are. So again, uh, yeah, history never trumps the Bible. But your weird interpretation of a passage in the Bible is not equal to Bible either. And it's not superior to history. So that's just something people need to understand. And when you hear people, you know, railing on Josephus, it's, you know, it's because uh, the things that he wrote proves that, you know, their interpretation of some prophecies are really bad. So uh, be ready for that. People will throw a fit about some stuff with Josephus. But, you know, the, here's the thing, too. Almost Everything about the details of the temple that people will talk about today, um, that's based off Josephus's writings. The Bible is not super explicit when it comes to a lot of those things. I don't think I don't think even most Baptists realize how much that they teach about Old Testament customs and things actually comes from Josephus. Because they're always like, well, you know, I got it from Bible manners and customs, or I didn't get it from Josephus, but they got it from a commentary that got it from Josephus. So he uh, he's he's the origin of a lot of stuff that a lot of people would accept and believe. In fact, if you even believe 70 AD happened, and that there was a, a seven-year war during that time between the Romans and the Jews, you know where you got that from? Somebody who got it from Josephus, because he was an eyewitness to those things and wrote about them, and um, even if you read other historians, they're actually quoting Josephus most of the time. There, you know, he was their source, and so um, I do believe that the writings of Josephus are a good historical source, but I don't, I don't think they're equal to the Bible. So, yeah, obviously not everything Joseph has said is accurate, but I mean, a lot of what he said, that's all we know. There's no right. other sources from the date, the time of the second temple to even get any information from except the Bible. Right. And yeah, because so. they'll talk about Titus, you know, destroying <clears throat> the temple. How do you know it was Titus? Right. Y you know that because of Josephus. <laughs> 
Oh, I, you know, I, I saw it on a YouTube clip. Okay, well, that guy got so the source <laughs> for all these different historical things is Josephus. So, right. um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think he's Bible at all, but I don't think it's wrong to cite history when when teaching certain things, especially if the Bible doesn't record it. You know, and, and the Bible does not record the destruction of Jerusalem. It, it, it doesn't do that at all. I think the closest thing we could probably find to an example of that is the fact that um, in Ro- or Revelation 11, which I believe was written after the destruction of Jerusalem, you know, it refers to the city of Jerusalem as Sodom and Egypt. Um, and I don't think that, I think one of the reasons it did that too is because of the fact that Sodom and Egypt were also places that had came under the judgment of God, and and Jerusalem had come under the judgment of God at that point too. So. Uh, and I, you know, and so I, I'm glad it didn't call it the holy city there. It called it Sodom and Egypt. So cause that's what it's really like. But, yep. uh, but yeah, so do we want to talk about some of the places we're planning on going when we go to Israel? Sure. I mean, it's pretty much every, I, I'm going to be there a month. So I'm pretty much going to go to every location in Israel and for either, to get just B-roll shots for the actual movie or just um, nice, pretty shots of the the country for, like, opening credits and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing I, I'm interested in, too, um, and I have not looked deeply into this. I'm hoping to maybe learn more about it when we go over there. But um, since they're wrong on the Temple Mount location... Does that mean they're probably wrong about Mount Calvary and the Garden Tomb? You know, I I'm I don't know if that changes things. So I don't know if the and, you know and and I do know that the Catholics they have a different uh, they have a different spot for those things. And so I would um, it's called the, you know they have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that's there in Jerusalem, and um, and I believe it's right by where. Uh, in a different spot where they believe Jesus was crucified. I've never even looked into, you know, whether or not that's a possibility uh, that that could be the actual location. Uh, when I went to Israel, we didn't go to those places. And so I'm kind of hoping maybe we can get over there and see if there's any credibility to what they're saying. Right. So uh, I don't know. I just know I don't trust these people very much when we go over there well same same as when we went to palestine we went for beyond jordan to where jesus was born i mean the odds of that being the actual location is very slim so i mean i think a lot of times people just they just make up these things because there's so little history that dates back to those times it's really hard to know well one thing that's interesting uh, about a lot of the biblical locations um there, you know, and one thing that's really cool about Israel too, because in America we don't have old stuff. You know, we don't have things that are more than two or three hundred years old. Uh, over there in Israel, you've got things two th- you know over two thousand years old because it's been around, you know around so long. But um, a lot of the you know biblical locations for things were supposedly what we were told um, they were actually marked by Constantine's mob back in the fourth century that she took a pilgrimage over there. And, um, and so, you know, in the fourth century, it wouldn't have been real hard for them probably to figure out where the original locations for those things were. Uh, but she supposedly had a lot of these places marked and then they like built churches on those places. So, right. You know, uh, the, so a lot of these places, I mean, it's been believed that those are the locations for, 1700 years so uh um, right yeah you know, e- either either way pretty interesting but you know um we're gonna go out and do some more clips i tell you one thing we'll do i don't know i don't think we're gonna hit 100 live streamers tonight but if we can get another five donations for brother paul i'm not getting any of this money but <laughs> if we can do another five donations come in and we'll, we'll take any amount i will I'll play the Bozo video. 
So are you are you able to watch to see what? Yeah, yeah. I just received another donation from Ellen Stacy, which has been a huge supporter of this movie, and I appreciate you, Ellen, for donating. Yep. We'll we'll, we'll count that as one. So we need four more, uh, four more, and we will we'll play the we'll play the bozo video. So y'all aren't gonna get it for free. This is pay per view, <laughs> and uh, that's how. Well, I'm excited uh, to see it, so I really hope people donate. Yeah, it's it's pretty embarrassing, <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and watch some more clips, and then yeah, we'll we'll go through these clips, give you all a chance, and after we're done with these clips, you're gonna run out of time. Uh, yeah, and if if the if the donations haven't come in yet, no bozo video. So, all right, go ahead. All right, here we go. Eliezer Ben Yair was a leader of a group of people who went to Masada after the destruction of Jerusalem. And these people were Sikari who are knived. You know, they, <laughs> they carried knives with them and they were extremist revolutionaries and they would kill people in the streets of Jerusalem if they thought they supported the Romans. So uh, he was the person whose speech was recorded by one of the survivors of Masada. And in that speech, we get the indication that the city of Jerusalem had been demolished, except for one monument, and that was the Roman camp. And he also said that the temple had been you know, dug up by its foundations. So we have these two things, because when we look at Jerusalem today, the only monument that dates back to 70 AD is the Haram Ishari. And there's nothing there for the temple stones. Yeah, so uh, that's another story, a historical event. A lot of people don't know about this. Really fascinating. Um, when I went to Israel, we went to Masada. And Masada was a very, uh, it's, it's a really cool place. It was very well fortified. It was very high up. And um, during that time of that uh, Jewish-Roman war, they uh, tried to go after that city, but they were they were so protected strategically, it was very hard for the Romans to get to them. So the Romans literally started building like a, a ramp to get up to Masada that's still there to this day. And, it, uh, and they didn't get real far. And I don't remember the details of everything that went down, but those people in Masada, they were crazy. They were, uh, they were these Jewish zealots. They were your hardcore, you know, gun-toting libertarian. You know, we're you know we're not doing anything the government says type of people back then. And um, I think what ended up happening, the Romans ended up where they were going to starve them out or something. I can't remember, but they all killed themselves. They ended up rather than getting taken captive, they all killed themselves. And it was just like a mass suicide. And uh, that was kind of how the Romans ended up winning that. But there's there's some writings from there about how the temple had gotten destroyed and how only the Roman fortress was left. So, Right. Well, the only guy that survived is the one that we get these stories from. Because the guy that survived is the one that talked everyone into killing themselves and then he didn't kill himself. Yeah, and that's typically the way typically the way it goes, you know, too big too big of a coward to do it themselves. Like Jim Jones, he didn't drink the Kool Aid. He did shoot himself or uh, had somebody shoot him. I can't remember, but they were they were kind of they were kind of a cult for that time too. So yeah, very uh, very interesting piece of history right there. If you ever get a chance to read up on that, look into that. It, you know, it's very inter and and the thing is too. That time was so horrible for the Jews. I mean, it was, it was uh, the siege on Jerusalem, over a million Jews were killed. I mean, the starvation that was going on, they're eating their own kids. I mean, it is horrible what they went through. And folks, that was the judgment of God on them for rejecting the Messiah. I mean, what happened to them, you know, it just goes to show you when Jesus said, upon this generation— Shall come all the blood of righteous Abel to Zacharias, the son of Barachias. They were severely punished for what they did because the killing of Jesus 
uh, while we benefited greatly from it. It was the greatest crime in all of human history, the shedding of the blood of the just one himself. So uh, when you look at that history, it's like, man, you know, and it's just a, it's a reminder to the rest of the world that what God did to Jerusalem for rejecting the Messiah, you know, after 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ of God doing all those things he did for him, understand the gospel has gone to the whole world and in these last 2,000 years. And you know what, what's going to happen to the world? Uh, same thing God did to Jerusalem. So what we're, we are going to see a repeat, I believe, of those seven years, but on a global scale. So interesting thing. But you got another clip for us to watch? Yeah, I do. And I just want to say thank you to Jonathan Reed for donating to um, the film. I appreciate you, Jonathan. You know, it's funny that the, the donations that have come in is, is just very familiar names that these are the same people that seem to always donate <laughs> to to this project and so i just i really encourage other people to support this film uh because you know if if everyone listening right now would just donate 50 bucks it would really make a huge difference in making this film awesome and so amen the faithful loyal few all right yeah. well we need three more all right here we go three more the Jews recaptured the Temple Mount in the 1967 Six-Day War. However, at that time, they wanted to curry favor with the international community, with the United Nations. They feared the government of the United States. So they struck a deal with Jordan that Jordan would send the religious waqf, which is the Muslim clergy, there to oversee the Temple Mount. Since the uh, Dome of the Rock was there, since the Al-Aqsa Mosque was there. Furthermore, the Jewish leaders did not want the temple to be rebuilt because they were secular. And if they right then would have removed the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque and built the temple, religious fervor would have swept over Israel and it would have swept those secular leaders from power. So they did not favor a temple to be built on the Temple Mount. So they have now left that under the Muslim authority, even though the Jews are the ultimate authority. That's the reason nobody can pray on the Temple Mount now, except for Muslims. All that's getting ready to change though, when the peace agreement is signed. <laughs> now, obviously we don't agree with everything that's being said in these clips. I'm just playing some good clips. From, and, and these aren't necessarily going to be in the film either. So I just quickly chose one good clip from each person. Yeah, I, that was interesting what he was saying, though, because I'm not familiar with some of the details there of what he was talking about. But uh, that is another fascinating thing as far as the just the political dynamic of everything, as far as, you know, who's really in control. I've heard some people say technically the Vatican owns the Temple Mount, but, you know, they're kind of you know, let the, but most people do, and I don't even fully understand it. Um, I think beyond Jordan, you guys explain this a lot and there's a lot of interesting facts on there, but just the whole dynamic of things, um, you know, as is with the, uh, you know, Israeli Palestinian, you know, the way things work there because of the Israeli occupation. And it is, it's like the Israeli state, it's not even technically fully like this sovereign nation you know it's it really is a complicated thing they have going there and it really is kind of just a big sham in a lot of ways and um and, and because it's not clear you know who really has authority and control over different things that's why there's always so much fighting over there so Right. I have a, we should do a giveaway for marching design real quick. Um, I have a question for those in the chat. Who is the person in 1913 that bought the land, uh, the city of David, bought all the land in the city of David? Which, which person in 1913 bought all the land? So that's a good question. 
Was that on Marching Design? No, it wasn't. No. Nope. Okay. I so I don't remember that. No, someone told me this in one of the interviews, and I was like, no, that's not true. And then I looked it up, and it's true. So who who's the one that bought so, the and, – and this is – the City of Dave is where we believe the Temple Mount truly was. So who bought that? Ah, yep, Rothschild. That's, but let's get – what's his first name? Let's, what's his first name? What's his full name? So Rothschild bought he owned the did yes. they still own Mount Zion? Yeah, he he bought it and that he's the one that uh he bought it to ex- excavate the whole thing. That's what started wow. the whole excavation process. That's very that's very interesting. It's yeah. amazing how those guys' names are on everything. Yep, not Gary Rothschild. No, that that name is not Jewish. Right. And and these folks too, you know, the Bible prophesies that you know, the Lord is going to reign from Mount Zion when when he returns. That's where it's going to be. It's going to be uh, Mount Zion and, and Mount Zion is outside the it is outside the Temple Mount. So if you're ever looking at that Dome of the Rock, you'll see those that walls, of that Roman fortress that, you know, people act like, you know, you got that eastern gate. They'll call it there. That's not what it was, but it's off to the left outside those walls. That hill there is as Mount Zion. So we got Baron Rothschild, yep, Herschel. Baron. Johnny Reed got it. Good job, okay. Johnny. So send me an email at filmnut99 at yahoo.com. Let me know you got it and your address, and I'll ship it out. Awesome. All right, so you ready for another clip? Yeah, let's do it. Here we go. I do not know an archaeologist, not one in Israel, that thinks that the Temple Mount is at the city of David. They all believe it's up on the Temple Mount where uh, we have seen it. Uh, to me, that this is a form of anti-Semitism. Uh, the cry of anti-Semitism is the Jews are to blame. The Jews uh, are wrong on this and, and so forth and so forth. And that is the bottom of what's being declared here is the Jews have lied to us. The Jews have concealed everything. Um, that The Jews are wanting to take the Temple Mount from the Muslims uh, and so forth. And so uh, I think it's a very, very dangerous, dangerous thing. All right. So is that guy Jewish? He's a, he's a Zionist. He's like, he's not a Christian. He's just like, just some... Zionist. I think he's so he's yeah, saying he's it's anti-Semitic to say that the Temple Mount is not the Temple Mount, right? And he's the official. He has a very good relation with all those main guys over there. I don't want to say their name. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. So yeah, the anti. They just anytime you say something they don't like, they just call you anti-Semitic. So, so we still need three more donations, right? Yeah, Valid Core, Valid Core, you won actually. Because Johnny right. is in uh, Canada. So, Valcor, you're oh, okay. the, the next one up. Okay. So, yeah, get those last donations in there. We're all, we're almost out of time. We're going to go ahead and try to play these last clips. H- how many more do you have? Oh, I got a bunch. Yeah, I need to go back. I need to go make sure I watch all those interviews because some of these clips are interesting. I'd like to hear the rest of what these people have to say because I haven't checked these out yet. All right, let's just play a couple then. Here we go. Okay. The Western Wall is uh, part of a retaining wall that was built in the days of Herod the Great to essentially support the, the flat surface on which the temple compound stood. It's known as the Wailing Wall, probably uh, by non-Jews because uh, it was and still is customary for Jews to uh, go there to pray and to bewail uh, the destruction of the temple, the loss of uh, Judean uh, sovereignty, and so forth. During the Middle Ages, in the early modern period, there was a group of uh, what you might call professional pietists, people whose job, so to say, was to, um, was to uh, express mournfulness uh, at the temple. Uh, and so I imagine that some Christian pilgrims and others uh, witnessed, uh, you know, scenes of 
of pain and, and open expression of pain. So, so they called it the Whalen Ball. All right, let's just go right into the next one. Here we go. The Western Wall represents the collective memory and collective narrative of the Jewish people. And um, uh, it represents our hope. It represents our ambition. It represents how uh, even when we are forced to leave our homeland, we, our hearts never leave there. And that we plan to return one day and that we made that, as the founder of the Zionist movement, Theodore Herzl said, Im Tirzu Ein Zohagada, uh, if you will it, it is no dream. If you want it badly enough, it's not a dream. And I think today getting to pray at the Western Wall um, shows that that's a true statement. Let's play one more. Again, let's go back to uh, the history of Haram Sharif. Uh, for Muslims, uh, they believe that uh, Prophet Muhammad had a night journey that uh, Angel Gabriel take him from, took him from Mecca into Jerusalem, into the site of Al Haram Sharif. And then he ascended to heaven from, from that location. So, so that site is uh, sacred and also is mentioned in, in the Quran that uh, in, in, in uh, talking about this night journey, God talks about that site. The second importance is that Jerusalem as a city uh, was a destination or, a, or a, um, uh, a direction for the prayer. That every, like the Jews, when they directed their prayers, they directed it toward Jerusalem. Christians, early Christians, they did the same. And early Muslims did the same before changing the direction into Mecca. So, so that location, uh, if you look at uh, historically, when, when uh, Muslims went into Jerusalem, that location was a garbage dump. It was, it was not so, a sacred site. Uh, it was a garbage dump. And, and, and uh, Muslims, uh, what they did is that they built, they built the mosque there. So the Haram al-Sharif area has two mosques. It has the Dome of the Rock Mosque with the golden uh, dome. And then they have the Masjid al-Aqsa, which is next to it. But it's, it's a 36-acre area. Uh, the whole area to Muslims is sacred. I'm always, like, shocked at some of the th things that these Ju the, the Jews will mention that are true. But it's like, okay, you know this, so why don't you understand this? But, like, they were talking about the Wailing Wall, how it's a retaining wall. And um, they have that rock that they're known as the Dome of the Rock. And so what they had to do is they have that rock peak there that's in the center. So they had to build that wall all the way around there that they were able to fill in with dirt so they could have a flat surface, you know, up on a high place like that. And so, uh, you know, the fact that they, you know, they did all that in that location, while it makes perfect sense for a Roman fortress, it doesn't really make sense to do the temple there because again you need a water source and the Gihon Springs um, it just happens to be over in Mount Zion and you would have had to have a major water source to be able to do all the washings and cleansings they had to do with all the sacrifices and all the blood that's being shed you've got to have a major water source and the only spring that has ever been discovered anywhere in that area is over outside that Temple Mount, the traditional Temple Mount area um, in what is known as Mount Zion. So it's just interesting when you hear them talk about all these facts about it that are accurate, but also are clear evidence that that wouldn't have been the Temple Mount, but a Roman fortress. So I, I was kind of taken back by some of the stuff that they mentioned that was right. Right. All right. Well, I think the next clip goes into that. So let's just play that real quick. The only source of water in Jerusalem is the Gihon Springs, the only source of water. It is a unique type of spring under pressure. An analogy is that it is like Old Faithful at Yellowstone Park without the heat. And it 
has, it's under pressure, this type of spring called a karst spring is under pressure and it's, it's under, it's like a siphon spring. It fills up, then there's enough pressure to push the water up. It literally went up 40 to 45 stories from the Gihon Spring inside the temple up to the top of the temple. And I have 10, I've written an article, and Dr. Martin covers most of them, 10 historical non-biblical sources that say there was a flowing spring inside the temple. There's no source of water on the Haram Sharif, on the so-called Temple Mount, but there is at the Gihon Springs, which is a major reason, besides Jesus' prophecy of no stone being upon another, uh, of where the temple was located. There has to be water in the temple. If you check scripture, everywhere the uh, tabernacle stopped, there was a source of water, or God made one. It wasn't just that the people needed water, they did, but there was a source of living, flowing water. You can't, John baptized in flowing water. You can, a Jew can be baptized or ritually made pure, in the ocean. They always, synagogues were built near water, not for necessarily ritual purity, but just for, because that's what they were familiar with. The temple had this marvelous, unique, in the, almost unique in the Middle East, because it went up so high. That's what made, attracted King David to uh, Jebus, which became Jerusalem, the city of David, was because, because of the source of the water. And it was easily defensible because of the steep slopes. The water was above. They terraced the area. And Solomon built, remember Solomon says he built himself gardens. That was all from, the temple didn't need all the water all the time. So they used it to grow crops right there. This thing was intermittent. There was actually a machine that the Talmud talks about made out of wood, and it was constructed that when the Gihon wasn't flowing, like on the feast days, uh, which sometimes they were a week long, uh, the feast festivals, it would be able to draw water from a general pool that is now open to the, uh, to the, to the air. So the siphon is broken, and the Gihon Springs, you know, still flows, but it's not under pressure right now. So it's a bit of a situation to think back, okay, well, how did this work? We know the water went up there. We have, you know, Gentile sources saying it did. Tacitus reports that there, the Roman historian says there was water inside the temple in a fountain. The Dead Sea Scrolls talk about the fountain of the Beth Shem, which is the house of the name, a name for the temple they couldn't say the, the name. Uh, so all these things put together really uh, help contribute to the location of the temple. There's no water on Fortress Antonia, the Haram as Sharif. Now, there were aqueducts, and Josephus describes one of the aqueducts. There were earlier aqueducts built by the Hasmoneans. But in the Roman period, Pilate, contracted and convinced the Jews to build an aqueduct from Bethlehem area, which was higher up than the Jerusalem. An ever so gentle slope, and it went into Fortress Antonia. So they think that that's where the temple was because that's where the water came from. But none of that existed in the time of Solomon or up until the second temple was, was built it, when the exiles came back from, from Babylon. It's a very interesting situation, and they have no answer to that. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, one of the things when I started looking into this that just really had me smack in my head um, is, you know, when I went to Israel, we went to the Kihon Springs. We went to Mount Zion. We went to, into Hezekiah's Tunnel. But the thing is, you know, and while I'd read through my Bible several times at that point, when we're reading our Bibles, we don't pay a whole lot of attention to 
some of those, um, you know, geographical references because we don't have a picture in our mind, you know, because we're reading about some place far off on the other side of the world from 2,000 years ago we've never been to. But the thing is, you know, when you're in those places or if you're like an archaeologist or something, you pay very close attention to those details. And so, um, you know, af once you've kind of seen it and actually paid attention to it, it just becomes very obvious that these aren't the right locations. And I remember, you know, so it's like I, I read this stuff now and I remember what was said when I was over there. And I'm like, how did I not just see right through this? But, you know, if if you were if if somebody who's never been to Rock Falls before was reading a story about Rock Falls and, you know, and we start talking about how, you know, different streets and we started I started saying, you know, after I left the church, I went and I crossed over the, the Hennepin Canal. And then after I crossed the Hennepin Canal, I went up to this street and, you know, and I started like giving all these details. When you're reading that book, you're not really thinking about those details because it means nothing to you because you're not familiar with those areas. You're just interested in ultimately where I'm going. Um, so it's just going to kind of go over your head. But then if you came and visited here, and then you see him picking up. Oh, I remember him in that when I was reading that story talking about that. There it is. And so that happens when you go to places like Israel. A lot of those details like that, that you know, we don't pay much attention to. When you go over there, all of a sudden you do start paying attention to those details. And it really gives a clear picture in the Bible for you. Well, if you go over to Israel. And you start paying attention to those details and look at what they're telling you is the Temple Mount. It's real easy to say this doesn't make any sense at all, you know. So, uh, what that guy was explaining and what you know, guys like Robert Cornuke, I mean, yeah, you can't help but see it when you're over there. Sure enough, this is it. So, hopefully, uh, you know. Now, obviously, everybody can't go over to Israel, but you know, I'm looking forward to seeing some of the shots that you get of these locations of these places you know some of the drone footage and then just some of the actual videos of the springs and um of mount zion it's really gonna i think make people's bibles come alive to them i think when they read these stories all of a sudden they're gonna be paying a little more attention when it's talking about some of these you know geographic things right yeah and i i think this subject is just so fascinating and uh, I think this movie will really be enlightening for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, there's there's six interviews, six little clips I have left. Two of them are you. So the next one's you. Okay. Let's all right, well, folks, y'all run out of time. As soon as these clips are done, uh, we're we're shutting this down. So we've got what three more donations we got to get in. So you bet you better get on it or no bozo video. I promise. <laughs> I I will not do it. If, if we don't get the three more donations. So <laughs> right. let's go ahead and watch the next clip. Here we go. Christians in no way, shape, or form should ever support the rebuilding of the temple. We understand that it is coming according to Bible prophecy, but so is the persecuting of the saints, but we wouldn't support that. The Jews demanding to rebuild a temple is a constant reminder of their rejection of the Messiah. They reject that atonement, that blood sacrifice that was offered for their sins through the body of Jesus Christ. They reject that, and they want to go back to the old way that God completed, that God finished. And so whenever we support the rebuilding of the temple in any way, what we're doing is we're basically um, telling the Jews that their way is okay, that their way is fine for them, when the truth is they must, if they're going to be saved, if they're going to receive salvation, they must uh, trust in the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made 2,000 years ago on the cross. So there is no reason at all for a temple, spiritually speaking, when it comes to salvation. All that will be accomplished with the rebuilding of the temple is it will, the, it will be used for the Antichrist to place his image where he will declare himself to be God and where I believe he will announce his war with the saints that he's going to make. So I will never support the rebuilding of the temple, and I don't believe any Christian should. All right. Um, yeah, man, I've, I, I was, I weighed a little more back then. Uh, <laughs> but, um, 
Johnny Reed asked the question, how far away is the original uh, Temple Mount from the counterfeit? And I, it's not that far. Um, I couldn't tell you the exact distance, but I mean, it's, I said, it's not far off, but it, the key thing is it is outside the walls, which is that area that's controlled by the Muslims. And so it's interesting if a Jew owns Mount Zion, why aren't they rebuilding the temple over there? You know, why can't they just go take the real temple Mount and leave the Muslims alone? You know, and and I, I would like to ask some of these rabbis that question, just if, you know, and if they won't get too offended, I just want to ask them if it were to be proven that the Temple Mount was somewhere else, would you be willing to build the temple there? So, um, but I, I've, I've been told that's a, an offensive question, but I can't help but ask. And, and it is, it's not far off at all. But I think the Jews probably wouldn't like it being over there, too, because then the Dome of the Rock, it would be sitting up above their temple. And I think they I think they like that spot because of, you know, the, the location and everything. But it's still not the original location. Right. All right. So we'll go to the next clip. Let's do it. Yeah, I remember one time I was in Los Angeles and we were at a conference where we had Jewish and Christians dialoguing and the head rabbi of all of LA was just horrified. He saw a copy of our, of our book. This was in the nineties. And he said, this, this is one of the most blasphemous things to him would be uh, the reinstitution of sacrifices. And so most Jewish people, and he, he was a lip, what we call a liberal or reformed Jew. You know, they don't take things literally. I just assume that by that time, there'll be some kind of, uh, you know, intellectual shift toward uh, temple sacrifices. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, you know, I forgot. I wanted, uh, after we went over there and talked to him, I wanted to go get a copy of that book about the third temple. I just read it. Is it pretty good? It's an easy was- read. It took, it? I read it all in one day. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'm, I've been, I, I totally forgot about that until, until I saw it there. And that, that was an interesting interview with him. I really enjoyed talking with him. That was, uh, uh, that, yeah, that was really good. So, all right, we got a few more clips. Let's, let's do those clips. All right. Get those donations in. Yeah. And guys, if you want to watch these clips, go to framing the world TV and you can watch all the clips on framing the world TV of the of what we shot the full the full interviews here we go many Jews believe that it's the Messiah himself who will return and actually build the temple and many believe that it's actually the temple in heaven that will come down to earth and that will be the third temple so there's a few different views now if a giant temple comes down from heaven and if it lands somewhere we're gonna go I guess it's there if the Messiah comes down and he rolls out some architectural plans and says, we're putting it here, we're going to put it there. Yeah, and so th- that's interesting, too, because again, that's the other thing a lot of people need to understand about this. Most Jews don't want the temple until the Messiah comes. So um, I would say the, a large, large majority of them view that, yeah. So, so that's the thing. When they start trying to rebuild the temple that's i'm just i'm pretty convinced that it's going to be uh it's going to be the antichrist you know and uh you know i'm not going to go run up my credit cards or anything after that happens but at the same time i'm going to be watching him like a hawk i'm pretty sure that's going to be kicking it off you know and somebody said there will be no third temple and you know and obviously i don't think there has to be I, I really don't. I don't think there that this is something that has to happen in order for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. Um, you know, there's other theories out there that kind of make sense, but um, when you when you do look at the very clear uh, you know interpretation or you know uh, reading of the text, you know, with the beast, you know, putting his image up in the temple. 
when you look at what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, and then you look at what the Jews are planning and actively preparing for, it's almost impossible to imagine it happening any other way. But, um, so yeah, I'm not dogmatic that it has to come. I'm just pretty sure it's going to. So, right. Let's watch the next clip. Here we go. Three left. It is expected by the Muslims when the end time comes closer, the Jewish population will congregate within the Holy Lands. The Al-Aqsa Mosque would be rebuilt as Temple Mount or Temple of Solomon. And this is all in preparation of, according to the scholars, what I have heard is uh, to bring the Messiah back to the earth who would lead the Jews in bringing back the kingdom of David, or that is their theology, that is their understanding. So that was a Muslim there talking about what the Jews think, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, he's an imam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm really hoping to talk to some uh, imams while we're over there just to kind of, I want to hear just what they think would happen if the Jews took over some of these questions, I'm honestly, I'm a little scared to ask because I just picture these people like losing it on me, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could be tactful and ask it in a way where they won't try to chop my head off. Right. Well, obviously they, they yeah. all pretty much say the same thing is they're waiting on the Messiah to return for these mm -hmm. saints. And that's what their prophecy says. Yeah. So, yep. so, all right. Here are two more, guys. Two yeah. more clips. Get those donations in. After these two clips, we're going to shut it down. So I really want to see go. that Bozo video. Here we go. <laughs> the idea of rebuilding a temple is very controversial in many ways. Uh, what, what, what would, assuming there were no mosques, assuming the temple were, was going to be rebuilt, how would it function? The temple used to have animal sacrifices. Maimonides in the 12th century already discusses this at length. The temple was already gone over a thousand years at that point. Even by the year 1200, people thought of animal sacrifices as being very primitive. And even Maimonides says if the temple were ever rebuilt, there would just be grain offerings and oil offerings and not, no animal sacrifices other than, than on the eve of Passover. The creation of a temple would be complicated. How would it function? Who would the priests be that would function in the temple? This is all notwithstanding the fact that the holiest, one of the holiest spots in the Muslim world is sitting where the temple was. It's so ironic. It sort of solves a problem in a weird kind of way because unless you want to have World War III, uh, that mosque is not going anywhere. And that is the only place the temple could be. So we're sort of like in a checkmate for the moment. So to say ever, ever is a long time. Not, I don't expect to see a temple in my lifetime. See, that's a common thing you hear people say, too. World War Three is what would happen if they were to get rid of the the mosque. And, yeah, but the thing is, isn't that kind of what we see, you know, in Revelation? You know, the, uh, the way most people think things are going to play out is that the Antichrist is going to come, come to power. Well, the thing is, it always takes a crisis for their, them to get away with a big power grab. And I personally think that the crisis um, could just be all the turmoil in the world because of Islam. And I think they're doing the, all, I think all these wars we've been doing in the Middle East with the Muslims, it's been stirring things up there, driving all of them into Europe and all these other parts of the earth. And it's destabilizing the rest of Europe too. And so the, the more those people get spread around, the more turmoil there is in other parts of the world. And so, uh, maybe somebody's going to come along and finally take care of all them Muslims, you know, and if that happened, a lot of people would love them. And so, you know, said so again, it doesn't have to be this way, but just seems pretty likely. This is just us watching. So, right. Well, Dustin for... Helm just donated. So what is that? One more left? I think is that one or two? Oh, man. Well, Dustin one. Helm, I appreciate your donation, man. I, th film. I think I think there's two left. Two left. Okay. Well, two there's... left. All right, folks. Two left. <laughs> so, Y'all. And we've only got two clips left, too, right? Yep. No one. All right. This is it. This is the final. Danny, one. Danny, are you the guy that's been sending me all those emails? You know, 
mapping out the Daniel 70th week and all that because I haven't read all those yet. They're super long and complicated, but <laughs> somebody's been sending me uh, emails unlocking the secrets of the universe, and I, I need to check those out see if there's anything to it. He just said he solved Daniel's 70 week mystery. So, uh, and, and you know, the day Armageddon is going to happen. I think that is the guy that's been emailing me. I need, I need to check that out. So, all right, let's go to the next clip. There you go. Another interesting fact about these temples and how they're named after someone is the fact that most Jews today, if you ask them when they think the temple will be rebuilt or what it's going to take for the temple to be rebuilt, they will tell you, well, the Messiah is going to have to come for the temple to be rebuilt. And so they are, most Jews that are wanting the temple to be rebuilt don't want to start it until the Messiah comes. So when this man comes along claiming to be the Messiah, then, uh, you know, that's when they're going to want to build that temple. So I think that's more evidence that they're going to name it uh, after the Messiah. And um, I, I believe that's how one of the ways we'll probably recognize who the Messiah is, whoever it is that promotes and, and gets the ball rolling with the rebuilding of this temple. I just noticed, I said, that's how we're going to know who the Messiah is. <laughs> I meant false Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I, me I, meant, I meant false Messiah there. I'm not looking for the Messiah. Uh, he already came. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, no, we haven't played any Bill McGregor clips. Bill McGregor's already predicted the rapture. He knows, too. <laughs> Maybe that's who Danny is. He knows I won't listen to him if he says his real name, Bill McGregor. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> but in, anyway, uh, okay, folks, this is it. We are going to the last clip. No, that's so that you, was it. That was the, oh, that was yeah, the last clip. Yeah. All right, so you're gonna have to get it in before we say our final words and close it out. I'll, I'll let you watch it, brother Paul, but I'm not, I'm not letting the rest of the world show it. I wasn't going to let them. I'm not going to let them watch for nothing. I'm saving this video to, <laughs> yeah, let's... to get something out of people because it is, it is pretty embarrassing that I was on national TV dressed up as a witch. Um, I know it sounds worse than it is. There's, there's an explanation <clears throat> of how it kind of happened, but, um, but yeah, I, I know y'all want to see Bozo and, and I appreciate you doing your part, Dustin, but this is a team effort. And, um, if, if I'm going to publicly humiliate myself, I at least want brother Paul to be helped, uh, as a result, <laughs> as a result of it. Well, so. I, I appreciate everyone for your support. And I know a lot of the listeners probably maybe already donated in the past to this film. So, uh, I, I do appreciate you guys for the support. I think this film is going to be awesome. The clips that we played are not necessarily going to be in the film, but it kind of gives you an idea of what the film's going to touch on. And the film's going to go a lot more than what we even played on. We're going to go really big into the Talmud and uh, show like that the Jews actually rejected Jesus as their Messiah and prove that they hate Jesus and a lot of other things um, we're going to be discussed in this film. So it's going to be a great film, and I really hope you guys decide to support it, even if you do so later at a later date. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody had uh, said something too, like about the way they pray and they're kind of back and forth. Most of we are going to talk about that. But um, uh, yeah, it's one thing, another place I want to go to when we're there. Uh, along the Wailing Wall, there's actually an underground part that you can go to. And I remember when we went there, there's this place you go. It's way back there, way underground. And there's a section that only let men back there. They won't let the women back there. Uh, and there's like all these Jews in there doing their weird head banging thing against the wall, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it, it really is. I, you know, watching all these things that they're doing. And then again, showing what the Bible taught about all this stuff. I mean, it, it really just shows the blinders people put on when they go over to Israel and the fact that they're just not seeing rebellion. And, you know, in the, in the Bible times, whenever the prophets would look at Jerusalem, they would get angry. They would weep. You know, Jesus wept over the city, but today you have Baptists that go over to Jerusalem and they're not weeping over the city. You know, they're not looking at this stuff 
and getting angry, which is what they should be doing. You know, they're over there just getting their arm, you know, putting their arm around these rabbis, getting their picture taken with them. I stand with these guys. I support these guys. And I'm telling you, these Zionist Christians, they could not be any more opposite of Jesus Christ, of the apostles, of the, um, you know, the, the prophets of that day. And it really is a shame. And I hope that this video will will kind of be a, a wake up call to that, because I really do think most Baptists are going to have to admit that they're going to agree with most of what we're going to show in this film. And, uh, and in doing that, uh, if they just will think critically, I think it will, you know, be a wake up call to them that, you know, that their theology and some of this stuff is pretty messed up and they're out of line and they need to get these things right. So yeah, the way you donate, uh, first Baptist, there's a link right in the description. If you click on there, there's a link to donate framingworld.com store and uh should be real easy to use in fact yeah you just click on there you can select an amount to donate and then um yeah then just do it that way so is 50 the mi minimum they could donate yeah yep okay on there so yeah so hey folks this is a worthy cause uh you know don't be cheap. And you know what? If you're watching this after the fact when it's not live, even though you're not going to get to see the Bozo video, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> you'll still donate, donate anyway. But I'll tell you, um, I'll tell you what happened. If you want to know why I was, you know, I did all that dressed up like a witch and all that kind of stuff. When um, I was, I think I was nine years old. We, uh, we got tickets to go to the Bozo show. We watched it every day when I was a little kid. We were so excited about it. And uh, you couldn't pick the day you went. You just kind of got it. And the day that it said was the day you got to go. And they were filming their Halloween show that day. And so almost everyone's dressed up like monsters and stuff. I'm wearing regular clothes. So spiritual I was. But then um, they had actually pulled me and a couple kids aside before we went in. And I got to go in before everybody else. I got to, uh, I got to meet Bozo and Wizzo. I mean... You talk about starstruck. I mean, I am standing there on the floor before everyone's in there where they would do all their stuff. I'm like with Bozo the Clown. I remember he walked up to me, smiled real big, and he just kind of messed my hair up. And, uh, but yeah, and so they, uh, we kind of ran through a skit that we were going to do where it was like a magic trick. And I was the decoy. So they had a farmer, a p person who wore like this big costume and a mask they were the farmer and another one who wore uh like the black robe the hat you know the face of a witch and uh they gave the contest and the kids went their separate ways and then right away the farmer comes out and then the witch but then i came out dressed up as the witch first making it look like you know i, I was the one kid but in the meantime the real one they're back there like switching costumes so I was like the decoy to give him time. So I'm standing out there with Bozo and Wizzo on TV. <laughs> and then they're going through the story. And then they we acted like I forgot my broom. And so I had to run back to go get the broom. But then when the witch comes back out, it, that was the real kid. It wasn't me anymore. And so, uh, yeah, you would never know it was me, you know, had, had we not told you. So I was kind of helping him do a magic trick. And, uh, you know, and I look back, it's like, I dressed up like a witch <laughs> on national TV. You know, that was a big that? show too. That was a big show. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And so I, I went to, I went to one of the screenings too. I didn't dress did up really? as a witch though. No. Yeah. yeah. When I was a kid, I went with our church group. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah so that was, that was, that was a pretty big deal going to that. You know, I, I'm not going to lie. So I was watching some of that today. thinking that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, I, I am embarrassed by that whole thing, but oh, well, so, well, guys, just even if it's after this viewing, if you want to support the movie, we could definitely use it. So, um, 
I appreciate everyone's support tonight. Sorry you didn't get to see the Bozo clip, but yeah, another day. But you did good. We got up. We got up close to seventy viewers at one time, and and y'all did do some donations. There's still over fifty of you watching. Y'all are cheap skating out of me, waiting for the other person to do it. But yeah, the clock's ticking, and yeah, I I, I can't go back on it. And so, <laughs> um, I'm I'm gonna save it. I'm gonna save it for yeah, save it something something bigger one of these days so um but yeah but we appreciate you joining us and you know donate to the film if you can at least be praying for it i uh, pray everything goes well uh, when we go over to israel i'm not going to be over there for a whole month i'm going to be there for about 10 days but um my brother paul's going to be there for over a month and so should be an exciting time for sure and uh so just pray for god's blessing and all that so uh, you, you want to have the final word, Brother Paul? Yeah. All right. We got one more, actually. We got one Are more. Are you serious? We're so close. There's only one left. If oh. you had, let's, I mean, do you have like a, um, do you have a giveaway? We could do a giveaway. Oh, Give one more people. Come on. Just, we need a question, though. I don't have a question. Oh, uh, man. Um, Thank you, think. Mark. Ah, so, man. So O-E-L-K-E. Oki. I'm sorry if I butchered your name, Mark, but I appreciate the support. All right, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will. I will make you all miss it just because of we were short one donation. All I right. I really will. Yeah. Let's... So we, we got to have the one, but we'll, we'll do, we'll go and do the giveaway. We can't keep delaying this. I, I'm getting tired and my throat's hurting anyway. Okay. So uh, <laughs> let me hold on one second. Okay. All right. So anyway, uh, but yeah, so about the Bozo show, um, I, I don't know how many of you all ever watched that, but um, you might remember Cookie, too, from the Bozo show. He was also one of my favorites. He had retired because I think he had some health problems, but what was cool, he was there during the whole thing watching the show, and I recognized him even though he didn't have his clown makeup on. And I never got to talk to him, though, but I did get to shake Bozo and Wizzo's hand. Sounds All right, I got cool. a question. This right. probably means that you already have this DVD, so we'll give away a different DVD. Um, let's say uh, uh, one of the – how about Beyond Jordan? We'll give away Beyond Jordan. Okay, so w what are the executive producers in Marching Design? So you're probably – you're going to have to go get the – there's only a couple of them. So just na list off one name of the executive producers. For Marching Executive Zion. Marching Zion, yeah. I wouldn't know that. That's all I got, though. I, I'm terrible at these giveaways. <laughs> Is that why Steven Anderson calls so many people bozos? Beyond Jordan. I, 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 I said I was actually on the bozo show, so I don't know if that makes me more likely to be a bozo, or maybe that's why I... I don't think I use that word as an insult as much as a lot of people, just because I like Bozo. Johnny I Reed, Larry Jordan. He got it. Johnny Reed, man. He's on fire tonight. He's getting everything right. All right. Well, that was the only one he won, though, Johnny. Oh, no, okay. you're living Canada, Johnny. Okay, now we need uh, someone else. Stop answering. <laughs> it's always the Canadians that know everything. Yeah. Okay, no, give me he another just the, He just answered the question right, Brother Matt, so... Uh, we you need got, another you're gonna name. To, you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to donate. All right. So, and I donate the gift for another donation to see Bozo. Oh, he did. Someone no. donated. Ellen Stacy donated. She did another donation. Yeah, she did. Oh, it. Ellen, good for you. All right, she did it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here's what we will do. Um, I guess we'll close it out. Yeah, just close it out with, with that video. We'll close it out with the video. So, um, yeah, it's not quite a full screen thing. It's shaped weird. So what I have on here, it's it's three minutes and 51 seconds. You'll want to cut your mic after we're done with this, but but uh, stay on there. Um, yeah, so I just have, like, the intro. Uh, I wanted to leave the intro on there just in case there were any – uh, previous Bozo fans just for nostalgia. <laughs> and then after that, it's the skit 
where I'm at. And like I explained, I was the decoy. So you, the first witch person that comes out in the witch costume, that's me. When I leave to go get the broom, it's not me anymore after that. So Matt McLaughlin just donated too. Thank you, Matt. Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you, Matt. So you all doubly deserve it. So here we go. So this is it. We're all done. We're going to end it with the Bozo video and let y'all laugh at me. But we appreciate the donation. So I appreciate you guys. Here we go. Bozo Show is on the air. Starring Bozo, the world's most famous clown. Ooh. Oh, I have a problem. Oh, yes, you do, Wiz. That's, yes. that's good. That's, that's, a, that's a sign that you're getting over it. The minute is you admitting it. But the problem is, you know what it is. What? Do you know the farmer and the witch story? No. They had to leave. The farmer and the witch had to go to Zanzibar. No. Yeah. Uh. And they won't be back. And I want to tell you. Bozo Show is on the air. Bozo Show is on the air. Starring Bozo, the world's most famous clown. Ooh. Oh, I have a problem. Oh, yes, you do, Wiz. That's, yes. that's good. That's, that's, a, that's a sign that you're getting over it. The minute is you admitting it. But the problem is, you know what it is. What? Do you know the farmer and the witch story? No. They had to leave. The farmer and the witch had to go to Zanzibar. No. Yeah. Uh. And they won't be back. And I want to tell this mysterious, mysterious story. Okay. I'll tell you what. Maybe if I had a couple of assistants, I could tell you the story. Assistants? Aha! Uh -huh. uh -huh. Aha, uh -huh. that right. looks just like the I witch. I know, I, assistance. A Assist couple of assistants, uh, please. A boy and a girl? A boy and a girl. Boy and a girl. Fine. Boy and a girl. Boy and a girl. Would you like to help? Okay, right here, you and you. Right. Yeah, right here. Step right over here. La, 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 la. Come here, follow me. La, 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 la. Girl, you stand right there. And boy, you come over here with me. What's your name? Cassie. Cassie, you are going to play the part of the witch. Ooh. What I want you to do is take this. And take the witch, witch costume? Yes. And take the broom? The broom. I come and me, Bozo yeah. will take you out there. La, 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 la. And then you stand right over here. Right. What's your name? Jason. What is it? Jason. Jason. Say hello to Wizzo. Doody, 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 doody. You are going to play the farmer. The farmer. You're going to take this, yeah. put it on, and then you're going to take the farmer costume. The farmer costume. And you're going to put it on. Yeah, hang and on. you are going to be wearing the farmer costume. Uh -huh. And you know who the witch is, uh -huh. right? That's Cassie. Casey. 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 Yeah, Cassie. You know, Cassie? Cassie. Cassie Casey. I'll yeah. tell you what. Take him back there. Take him back there. Step over here. And buddy. now, I wonder right. if I she's all dressed. On. Is she right. all dressed? Right. The oh, there she comes. Ooh. Ah. Ooh. Scary. No, she's not scary. This story was in a big farmhouse. Big farmhouse. In Arobia. In Arobia. There were fleas. There were fleas. <laughs> fleas in Arobia. Oh, no. What there else? There were three floors. Three floors. There was the garden apartment the that the farmer lived in. I thought he lived in the basement. No. It was up. When you look out the window, yeah. you see the ground uh -huh. that makes it a garden. So that's a garden apartment. And then on the top floor. On the top floor. Lived that's the penthouse. The penthouse, yes. Yeah. Which show? Which show the witch? Which show the witch? And in the center was a very mysterious person. That's where all those fleas were. Yes. Yeah, I thought so. But I cannot tell you all right. anything about the little apartment yes. because nobody knows too much about it. Did the witch did the witch clean up the house? Yes. Yeah, what did what, she use? Like a mop? No. She used a broom. Where's, oh, the, where's your that broom? That reminds me. Where's your, where's your... She hasn't got her broom. She doesn't have her broom. Go, go help I her get, get the broom. broom. Get the broom. Uh, all right. the farmer. Hurry up, right here. Go, go get uh, your broom. Hurry up. Get the broom. Uh, That's good. Perfect. Come on. Right over here. He fits That's that good. costume okay. beautifully, doesn't he? Okay. But there's something to this story yeah, you will not believe. What? One day. Yes? The farmer and the witch were talking. They were talking. But you couldn't hear them talking because you couldn't understand what they were saying. Why? Because one was talking yes? different than the other until I found out. What? That the witch. Yes? Was really. Yes? What? Yeah. The farmer. What? And the farmer was really the witch. Wow! It was so mysterious, I couldn't believe it. Wow! The Bozo 
Bozo Show will be right back. Bozo Show is on the air. Bozo Show is 